Hello, and welcome to another edition of Why Wasn't It Better. I'm Patrick Darms. And I'm Anton Paras. And here we are, about to review our second movie. Anton, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic, thank you. And how's your day going? Pretty good, you know, really no moves from the Knicks. I know your Warriors of Golden State have been, you know, making some moves. Let's see how that pans out. Punch in that ticket, folks. Warriors are going to the championships again. Back-to-back championships. Uh, Let's make sure to have that video recording time-stamped, and we'll get back to that. But this isn't a sports podcast. This is a very special podcast about our ideas on these films. Yeah. And before we really get into the format, I want to give a very special thanks to our friend Eric Taylor for producing this podcast. Eric is a composer and a producer. He goes under the name of Might Be Thunder. Check him out on all the major streaming platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, and please give him a follow on Instagram at Might Be Thunder. And then if you want to contact us, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback for us, we can be reached at wwibpodcast at gmail.com. That's wwibpodcast at gmail.com. We're not really on social media yet, but we may eventually get to that. Soon enough, you'll see our TikToks and all of our stories. But before we get to that, let's really dig into some very meaty content, because I know, Patrick, you've been very excited for this episode. I have been. I hope you have been as well. I remember when I first heard this as one of the movie ideas, and I thought to myself, this is going to get people heated. That this is maybe one of the, or this is one of those franchises where you have a lot of fans that are excited. It's true. And have their takes on why it shouldn't be besmirched by any criticism. There is a lot, it's a lot. Uh, but at the same time, I do appreciate. The amount of care, of course, that we take into our opinions and as well as the facts of why wasn't it better. I don't know how heated it's going to be. I think everything we're going to say is fair, measured, balanced, or maybe not. But uh, what what movie uh, what movie did I choose, Anton? We are entering the realm of Gotham City, but not not the first nor the second. But we're entering into the third of the Nolan film trilogy, The Dark Knight rises the dark knight and the batman franchise have had a long storied history of a lo- of different directors actors playing the dark knight and christopher nolan's take has definitely taken us for a, quite a wild ride as we start to dive into this film let's make sure to start of course with our bread and butter which is the facts of this film and uh, generally when it was released director and all those good bits so let's start off with uh, the release. So the film released July 20th, 2012, released by Warner Brothers, Legendary Pictures, our good friends at DC Entertainment, and Sing Copy Incorporated. Directed by the Christopher Nolan, a screenplay by Christopher Nolan and Jonathan Nolan, with a, the, an additional story credit for David S. Goyer, and starring Christian Bale, Tom Hardy, Anne Hathaway, Gary Oldman, Michael Caine, Marion Cotillard, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and Morgan Freeman. Quite a few of those names, I'm sure, listeners you recall, have been in a lot of Christopher Nolan films. A lot of heavyweights in this movie. A lot of the, a lot of those elements lead up to that very expensive budget of two hundred thirty million dollars, and coming in at a whopping box office amount of one. Billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so, of now that the setting has been, uh, or now that the stage has been set, let's go and dive into why we decided to choose this film. So, Patrick, can you enlighten me? Why was this movie chosen? Well, I think in many ways this is a no-brainer for this podcast. Talk about a high standard to reach. I mean, this is the sequel to The Dark Knight. Many people consider that to be the greatest superhero movie of all time. It's absolutely one of the greatest sequels of all time, and it's one of the greatest movies of all time. The hype for this particular movie, it wasn't quite at the level of its predecessor. I think Heath Ledger's death really added a layer of buzz to that for the obvious reasons. Right, but this right. is still 
one of the most highly anticipated sequels of the 21st century. It was immediately seen as not being quite as good as its predecessor, but it got really stellar reviews, 87% on Rotten Tomatoes. Now, I know Rotten Tomatoes isn't the end-all be-all, but 87 is pretty high. And it actually actually outgrossed The Dark Knight at the box office. Now, whether you're a Christopher Nolan fan or not, and I am for the record, he certainly raised the floor for superhero movies. Gone are the days of campy, goofy Batman. I appreciate immensely what Nolan did for Batman, the character, and the superhero genre in general. He elevated it, and I think he took it. He took it to places that it had never been before. I, I was just, I was just gonna say right there, like uh, when you look at uh, other comic book films of that era or even preceding it, it's hard to be able to capture the elements of what made Batman great and then bring it to the big to the big screen without it feeling a little too campy. So yes, big yeah. kudos to, to Nolan on that. Yeah. I do want to give a, a little sidebar. I don't want to neglect the other superhero movies of the era too. What Sam, Sam Raimi did for the Spider-Man movies, I think was equally successful, but there's a for very, the third one. Oh yeah. Wait till we get to that. But what he did in, <laughs> at least in the first two was equally successful, but they're very different movies, a very different take on the superhero genre. Right. Nolan and especially Christian Bale, they really rejuvenated the character and the series basically, I mean, in every way possible. Batman Begins and The Dark Knight are on the short list of the greatest one-two punch in movie history. I would put them just behind the first two Godfathers, first two Star Wars, Alien and Aliens. That's how good they are to me. Oh, yeah. What spurred me to choose this movie for this podcast was the following sentence taken from the Wikipedia article header of this movie. Quote, It is considered one of the greatest superhero movies of all time, one of the best films of the 2010s, as well as one of the best films ever made, end quote. I call bullshit on that. I don't know know a single person who would agree with any part of that statement. Are Are you telling our listeners that you don't have that tattooed on your back as a statement of truth? I don't. Fair. I do not. Fair. Now, my take on this movie without stepping on that section of the podcast, of course, is this is like the Godfather three of superhero movies. There was almost no chance of this being as good as what preceded it. But there's also questions about how it was made, whether the director was as invested in it as he was with the previous two. Right. And that's an area of an area of criticism, or at least an area of, of an argument for us that, We've talked about before, there's going to be levels of subjective versus objective criticism, and yeah. there are different indicators, of course, as to like why we think that way. So with that, let's go ahead and touch into the next portion, which is looking at the production history of this film. Yeah. Just to back up a little bit before we get into the production history, just a quick recap of the format of the podcast. We begin just as we did by introducing a movie and explaining why it was chosen for this podcast. We talk about how it got made, and then we ask the question, as is the title of the podcast, why wasn't it better? And we try to answer that question with a couple of core reasons that we think would explain that. And then we conclude by going over whether we liked the movie or not. But as for the production history of this movie, we should give a brief recap of the Batman series up until the point of this movie's release in 2012. Oh, that's fun. Makes sense. Everyone probably knows this. Um, We assume everyone's seen these movies a million times, but just for the sake of the podcast, we're going to do it anyway. So from 1989 to 1997, we had the core four Batman movies. The first two were directed by Tim Burton, the latter two by Joel Schumacher. The first three I would call enormously successful, in particular the first one. The first one, we're actually probably going to cover the first Batman movie on this podcast. And we'll get into the various reasons of just why that movie was so successful. But the fourth one, Batman and Robin, which came out in 97 disaster. And after that came out, Warner brothers canceled the sequel, which was going to be called Batman unchained. And that was also going to be directed by Joel Schumacher. So they made the decision to just reboot the franchise over the next several years. And they asked a couple different filmmakers to pitch their ideas for said reboot. Do you want to go over some of the ideas that we see here? I'd be happy to. There are a few different proposed uh, projects over the years. There was Batman versus Superman. So pitched by writer Andrew Kevin Walker. 
Akiva Goldsman was employed to actually write the screenplay and actually kind of amazing considering he penned Batman and Robin, but I'm guessing yeah. it was under contract. There was a live action adaptation of the animated series Batman Beyond uh, that was being pitched. A, a screenplay was written and Joel Schumacher expressed interest in directing, feeling that he owed Batman fans a better movie. And I can't imagine the studio seriously considering giving him another go after the uh, last fiasco. But hey, <laughs> there could have been a chance that Batman Beyond Terry McGinnis could have seen the silver screen at the time or at, at the same time as this. They were also considering an adaptation of Frank Miller's Batman Year One. So that was going to be directed by Darren Aronofsky, co-written by Miller himself. This generated the most excitement from Batman fans. I mean, it's Frank Miller, Darren Aronofsky, of course, uh, Darren Ar- uh, Aronofsky, of course, coming from great film lineage. This is also the first time where Christian Bale's name surfaces as a possible Batman, uh, uh, as a possible Batman. So a separate origin story was pitched by Josh Whedon that was quickly rejected by the studio. Whedon fans, of course, uh, cried out into the void. (laughs) Now, there's a few decisions left to the studio without a Batman film by 2004. So Warner Brothers quickly made Catwoman, which Halle Berry uh, was able to bring the Catwoman, (laughs) Catwoman Catwoman-esque performance, which completely bombed and is considered among one of the worst films ever made. Never seen it. So still haven't seen it i'd i'd say find the listeners find the youtube clip look this up pally berry and catwoman basketball scene if you're really looking just for a quick laugh and a really good quick one minute clip that really showed why it was such a horrible film but anyways back to (laughs) to get things back on track in january 2003 warner brothers hired christopher nolan to direct the next batman movie Huzzah! Nolan and David S. Goyer wrote the screenplay, aiming for a darker, more realistic tone, and their intention was to reinvent Batman by, quote, doing the origin stories of the character, which is a story that's never been told before. Patrick, where are we in the history with Batman Begins? Batman Begins, of course, comes out in 2005 to great critical and commercial success. It makes $372 million at the box office. Not as much as I remembered, but it was followed up three years later, of course, by The Dark Knight, which grossed $1 billion and is widely considered one of the greatest superhero movies ever made. And looking back on 2008, really was a watershed year for the superhero genre. In addition to The Dark Knight, we also got Iron Man, which launched the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We also got The Incredible Hulk the same year with Edward Norton, but the less said about that movie, it's like the Marvel movie that they pretend doesn't happen. Did not (laughs) set off the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But it did not. But the point is, superhero movies would never be the same after 2008. I don't think the movie industry was as well. It really changed a lot of things. Fast forward four years later to when The Dark Knight Rises comes out. By 2012, the MCU is in full swing. And any other year, I think Dark Knight Rises would have been the biggest movie of the year. But it's not. It got overshadowed by the Avengers. Now, this movie made a billion dollars at the box office. It was the third highest grossing movie of 2012. Can you name the two movies that outgrossed it. It's really, that's a tough one. I hope listeners are also guessing in their heads. I just said one one of them them fast and furious. No. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Shoot. The Avengers is one. Right. The other one is Skyfall, the bond movie. Oh, I'm sure that made you put a smile on your face. It sure did. But (laughs) the production history of this movie back in 2005 before Batman Begins came out, David S. Goyer, who co-wrote uh, the, these movies with the Nolan brothers, he confirmed that he wrote treatments for two films involving the Joker. The first would involve Batman, Harvey Dent, and Commissioner Gordon hunting the Joker, while the second treatment would have had the Joker scarring Dent and turning him into Two-Face during his trial. Now, this treatment ended in the same way as this film, and I think that's probably why Goyer gets a story credit on this movie. Now, between The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises, Christopher Nolan released Inception. I want to come back to that a little bit later. Inception has nothing to do with this movie and yet something to do with this movie. Now, Warner Brothers hoped to release this by 2011, but their commitment to Inception meant that this was pushed back another year. Can I just say that you've incepted into the listeners that you're going to talk about Inception later? You're quite welcome. (laughs) Thank you. 
studio executives at Warner Brothers, they wanted the Riddler to be included as the primary villain here initially, as they considered him similar to the Joker. And they actually encouraged Nolan to look about casting Leonardo DiCaprio in the role. But Nolan vetoed this. He wanted the, the villain to be as different from the Joker as possible. And he and that's how we got Bane. Now, Nolan's first draft of the script was reportedly inspired by Charles Dickens' 1859 novel A Tale of Two Cities, which centers around the French Revolution and class warfare. By February 2010, it was confirmed that Nolan would be directing this movie. However, just like The Godfather Part Three, the studio was going to make this movie with or without the involvement of him. Jonathan Nolan and David S. Goyer, they worked on the screenplay that eventually topped 400 pages. And at this point, during pre-production, Goyer leaves this project and he works on Man of Steel, which I think came out the year after this, in 2013. Now, this movie, they the script that they wrote and that ultimately ends up in the finished movie, it, was, it borrowed from the following comic series in Batman. Number one, Nightfall, which featured Bane as the main villain, during which he breaks Batman's back. Number two, Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, very famous one, during which Batman returns to Gotham City after a 10-year absence. Number three, No Man's Land, which depicts Gotham cut off from the rest of the world and overrun by gangs. Number four, something called the Legacy Storyline, which involves Bane becoming Ra's al Ghul's successor and plotting with the League of Shadows to destroy Gotham City. Put a huge pin in this because I want to come back to it. I just want to touch on, I have all of these, whether in graphic novel or in comic form, and it's just great to be able to reflect back on what was included or excluded. But huge shout out, of course, to the fantastic writers that put so much into those stories and then being able to put it together to even just bring it out to film. I know that this is us looking critically at The Dark Knight Rises, but especially when we look at the origins of where these stories even came from, it, it was able to being able to see that as a comic fan uh, come to life is always a treat. Definitely. The only one that I had ever read out of those four was the dark Knight returns, which I really, really liked. And um, the, the animated version of that, that came out a, a few years ago, it, it was like a two parter like DC animation did it incredible, really well done. Yeah, the the Nightfall storyline, it was a essentially in itself very very similar to the film, right? I mean, it was where where the origin of the Bane the Bane villain. It did have a very different. It had a very different Bruce Wayne recovery storyline after Bane broke his back, which also included a psychotic Batman um, stand-in who also was just the 90s archetype of having a lot of pouches and Hmm. what looked like a mega-sized armor Batman. Look it up. I think it was uh, Azrael was the character who stood in for Batman, who Batman who eventually had to fight to then reclaim his title as the Dark Knight of Gotham. But anyway, I could go on and on. Tell us, uh, this Selena Kyle. Tell us more about um, for the role of Selena Kyle. I I will, but I just want to say you clearly know a lot more about Batman than I do, and I'm impressed. My knowledge is limited to the movies and the animated series, which fantastic, fantastic. Love it, love it. Yeah, for the so for the role of Selena Kyle, Natalie Portman, Kira Knightley, Kate Mara. Gemma Atherton, Jessica Biel, Blake Lively, Lady Gaga, I don't know about that one, Charlotte Mm -hmm. Riley, and of course Anne Hathaway all auditioned for the role. Now after the initial process, Hathaway, Biel, and Mara all screen tested with the role eventually going to Hathaway. Now for Miranda Tate, aka Talia, we had the following actresses were considered. Ava Green, Naomi, Naomi Watts, Rachel Weisz, and Kate Winslet. Marion Cotillard finally got the role. I just got to say, Rachel Weiss, why not her? That's a, such an interesting choice. Why not Ava Green? I don't think Ava Green works for this one. No, but I, I, I do like films with Ava Green in them. Yeah, she's good. Casino yeah. Royale, man. Yeah, all-time great. But back onto it, I agree. Rachel Weiss would have been a very interesting choice for the role. Yeah. So that's that kind of that's the production history. That's how this movie got made. Let's talk about why wasn't this movie better. And here we are, true believers. We are in the meat of things. Why wasn't it better? Well, uh, Patrick, why don't you kick it off? Give us our first reason. I want to begin by asking a question. 
did Christopher Nolan really want to make this movie? And I ask this question with a caveat that I would never accuse Nolan of just doing this for a paycheck. He is far too much of an auteur for that. But answering this question, it's impossible to talk about this movie with that, without acknowledging that it, it is at, at best some kind of backup plan or plan B. And this is because of what happened to Heath Ledger. We, we know that the Joker was going to play at least some part in this. And we know that Nolan was forced to change his initial idea for the story in some way to accommodate Ledger's death. How do we know this? Well, Ledger's family stated that he was planning on reprising his role as the Joker before he died. And after Ledger's death, Christopher Nolan publicly decided not to recast the role out of respect for his performance. And it was, he was initially hesitant to make a third film. Yeah. And when we think about that, it's, it's hard to be able yeah. to follow up on such a fantastic performance from by Heath Ledger and Nolan referring to the, referring to the third film even said, maybe there's so much expectation in them, but I wouldn't want to do one if it weren't going to be as good as the first or second, that's not respectful to the fans. So already there's a bit of a hesitancy that we can read into that. Yeah. And right. Nolan yeah. wanted the story for the third installment to keep him emotionally invested. Uh, Patrick uh, touched on as an auteur, there's that passion for the film uh, uh, for filmmaking. So he quote said on a more superficial level, I have to ask the question. He reasoned how many good third movies in a franchise can people name? So there is a huge self-awareness in knowing that it's hard to keep up with those expectations, which drives more of that hesitancy. Nolan right. said that he never, ever thought a third film was possible in the foreword for his book, The Art and Making of the Dark Knight Trilogy. Uh, Nolan only agreed to a third film on the basis of finding a worthwhile story, fearing that he'd become bored halfway through production if he discovered the film to be unnecessary. So there's a lot of very clear awareness, honesty on why there was some hesitancy to even make the film on Nolan's part. Take this, take the following with a huge grain of salt, because I could not find a, what I would call a credible, credible source to confirm this, but over the years on several different forums, most notably the now defunct internet movie database forums, I read multiple times that Nolan only agreed to do this movie in order to get Inception made. He had been trying to get Inception made for a very long time and no studio would give him the budget. Now, like I said, I can't find any fire for this smoke, but that is something that I have read multiple times over the years, going back a decade now. The bottom line is this. Heath Ledger's death prevented Nolan from pursuing any original story ideas he had for this movie. I think Nolan did everything he wanted to do with the first two movies and he lacked the passion for this. To me, this will always be a what if movie. It's it's probably not the finished product that he originally intended, regardless of what he says publicly. Yeah, very fair. I think that's very well put. And there is some speculation but overall, there is a lot of evidence that goes to the fact that there was hesitancy into even making this film and a lot of just not wanting to disappoint with such high expectations. Yeah. And yeah, that's, yeah. that's there. So let's look at number two. So this is a very key reason for why we think it wasn't better or why wasn't it better storytelling too many characters too many subplots patrick this movie was way too long way, way too, too long. long it's it's a fine action movie but is it a good batman movie we say no you say that too well i <laughs> i will say i will say this when we know that the story in itself was supposed to be the bookend of a trilogy for the uh, for Batman. I think about the way that it ended. Well, this is just my take. The way that it ended and the way that the story played out. Not necessarily how I would imagine a bat Batman to kind of carry things out. So maybe not necessarily as a comic fan, as a fan of Batman. Right. Um, one of my favorites. 
I think you know what I think at this point. But this this had a as far as the storytelling goes, this had a very similar problem to Batman Returns. Batman himself does not get a lot of screen time in this movie due to the sheer number of secondary characters. Batman himself does not appear until 45 minutes into this movie. And sp- too many characters between Alfred, Lucius Fox, Commissioner Gordon, Bane, Selina Kyle, John Blake, Miranda Tate, John Daggett, Foley, who's the guy played by Matthew Modine. Nobody knows that one. And everybody else, there's just too many characters. They do the same thing that they did in the first two movies, which is they try to rely on the third act villain reveal for the third movie in a row. So in the first one, Scarecrow, you think, is the main villain. Then it turns out to be Ra's al Ghul. In the second movie, Joker's the main villain, and then they bring Two-Face in at the end. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong for that, wrong with that, right? It worked very well in the first two movies. But this is the third time in the row. Talia's character is completely unnecessary, I think, and basically does nothing but serve as like a false love interest for Bruce Wayne. Blake is an unnecessary character. They don't do anything with him. They don't you he, he supposed they set him up as Robin, but wouldn't his name just be Jason Todd or Dick Grayson or any of the characters that have played Robins? They don't use his name as Robin. And what was the point of the John Daga character? Do you even know who I'm talking about? There was um that was that was the du- the that was the dude who was was that the one who had the no <laughs> <laughs> he was the guy who was played by the actor Ben Mendelsohn he's trying he's the guy who's initially trying to take over Wayne Enterprises and you find out that he's been bankrolling Bane's operations and Bane is using his construction companies oh right that really creepy guy. Yeah, he's an unnecessary character. He's like a red herring because what's the point of him trying to take over Wayne Enterprises when Miranda just takes it over later on? For and then, then Ma- ba- Matthew Modine's character. Snap Bane does snap his neck. Snaps a lot of necks in this movie. Matthew Modine's character, he plays Foley, the assistant commissioner, who's the guy that's like doesn't like Gordon or right. whatever. Why is he in this movie? There's just too many characters. Because it was trying to prop up more of a moral compass compared to lines in the sand made by Bane's League of Shadows, perhaps. Perhaps. The Dent Act subplot was also mostly pointless. It kind of went nowhere because at the end, Commissioner Gordon just keeps his job. And as far as I know, all the prisoners get returned to Blackgate Prison. Then you have the subplot of Alfred digging up Rachel's letter, which was devastating to Bruce Wayne. In the behind the scenes of the Dark Knight trilogy documentary that accompanied the Blu-ray, Nolan said that he and his creative team, they wanted to make a film that embraced all of Gotham and focused on multiple groups, quote, of different people dealing with and encountering tumultuous events. I do recommend this documentary for anybody that loves these movies. It's actually currently available on Warner Brothers official YouTube channel. It's now it's also in that same documentary where Nolan mentions how he saw this movie as a quote disaster movie or historical epic, end quote. This is quite a lot of story for a superhero movie to tackle. Just like there's too many characters, I think he was trying to do too much with the story. We already mentioned the the sources for this movie, right? The four comic right. sources. So he tr- he's trying to combine plot points from No Man's Land, Nightfall, and the Dark Knight Returns, plus the legacy storyline, right? My understanding, I've only read one of them, but my understanding of these three are, the, are some of the more expansive Batman stories, and they don't all fit together. And that's before you add in the League of Shadows slash Talia shenanigans and the Occupy Wall Street stuff. So if you want to do Bane, just do Bane. If you want to do No Man's Land, just do the stuff in No Man's Land. Just pick a story and go with it. There's too much story squashed into this movie, and that's how you get a running time of two hours and 45 minutes. Let's really touch on that a bit. I mean, we've talked about the length. We've talked about what's going into just a very hefty film. And what does that create? That creates serious pacing issues. Uh, we'd have really to cut drags. out all the stuff. Yeah, we'd really have to cut out all that stuff with John Blake, Foley, John Daggett's character, the guy who plays Daggett's deputy, and Talia completely. Got to get rid of the stock market stuff just completely and have Bruce Wayne's stolen fingerprints used to steal the reactor core. That is um, the best fix you could make for this movie. That That whole stock market crap, cut it out 
and then how Selena Kyle steals Bruce Wayne's fingerprints, just have that used to steal the reactor core. Just get rid of all the stock market crap. Get rid of uh, de- the Dent Act uh, subplot that, m- or all mention of Harvey Dent, or the exposition scenes where there's flashbacks to Harvey Dent. Let's just get away with it, right? Yeah, the Occupy Wall Street stuff, it dates the movie in a particular way. Speaking of Wall Street, this goes into the storytelling. I think you watched these movies, the three movies back to back like me. Did right. you notice how they completely changed the previously established geography as Gotham City so that it would fit into Bane's plot? Right, because I mean, they did actually do the filming in separate cities, matching the tones of those cities as well. Yeah, a lot of this was filmed in Pittsburgh, and they did film stuff in New York as well. The thing that bothered me, they made no effort to disguise all of the Manhattan landmarks, like all the stuff on Wall Street. And then very visible was the Brooklyn Bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge, the Manhattan Bridge. I found this baffling because the lanes they went to disguising where they filmed the previous two movies in Chicago. Gotham City in this movie looks very different than the first two movies. Like the exteriors of the films of the first two films were shot entirely in Chicago. And in the first film, they used a lot of CGI to disguise all the landmarks. Now, in the second film, they let many of the iconic buildings remain in the skyline. But do you remember the Narrows from Batman Begins? It was like the slums. Yes, right. It was on that island. It was sandwiched between the two parallel peninsulas. Mm -hmm. So it's completely absent in this movie. It's just not even visible. Now, co-producer Emma Thomas, she's also Nolan's partner, I think. She said that they chose to shoot this movie in Pittsburgh to emphasize Gotham's immense size and scope because they literally shot every inch of Chicago where the previous two movies were shot. Well, it's no wonder it looks so different. And then you throw in the Manhattan stuff. Pretty noticeable if you watch these movies back to back. Let's do a quick shout out, though, to uh, Pittsburgh. The entire Pittsburgh Steelers team getting uh, eaten up by one of uh, Bane's uh, field eating bomb mechanisms. That was a pretty cool scene. That was a pretty cool scene, yeah. But But as far as the storytelling goes, I think I just shit on it significantly. But I do want to give, while I said there's too many characters in this movie, I do want to give the actors credit because this movie is brilliantly acted with one notable exception. Christian Bale and Michael Caine are outstanding in this movie. Their scenes together, they have just the right amount of motion, emotion, and they they continue what they did in the in the previous two movies. They're amazing here. Anne Hathaway is amazing as Selena Kyle. It's kind of a shame we're probably never going to get to see her again in the character. Right. When you think about, well, I just wanted to touch on Christian Bale and uh, Michael Caine especially being just Nolan mainstays, we can see why. Being able to direct that kind yeah. of emotion in whatever roles and then seeing them in Batman in, in the Batman films. It's uh, being able to add that amount of humanity to the character that's really necessary. And 100%. For a lot of there were high expectations for the film. One of them that really did, I think he did a really great job. Uh, Tom Hardy as Bane. Um, I think he did fantastic. And he really did his best physically. I mean, despite the very muffled voice, it, it, I think that it's really grown on people over the years. Would you, would you agree there, Patrick? I would. I think he's amazing in this movie. Initially, the voice... I thought it was silly, but it's really grown on me over time. Where his performance succeeds, looking back on it more than 10 years out now, of how unique it is, I can't recall really ever seeing anything quite like it. Now, he had a little bit of the benefit where he wasn't playing a role like the Joker. Like The only prior portrayal of Bane in Batman and Robin was just so unbelievably stupid that nobody really remembered it. And Hardy is such a talented actor that the odds were very much in his favor. And he crushed it. He nailed. He just owns every scene he's in. And his performance, like you said, it's really developed a life of its own beyond this movie. So then where where is our weakest link? Miranda Tate. It's the wrong actress chosen for the role. I don't think the role is particularly necessary to begin with. I think her character relegates Bane to that of a henchman just at the basically the climax of the movie. Her betrayal is telegraphed because she played the role she did in Inception, the second you see her on screen here, she's not fooling anybody. It it was very easy to see it coming. She's in almost every scene before the reveal has something to do with the nuke 
that Bruce, that Bruce Wayne just blindly trusts her character with. He's like, here, you, you control it now. It's fine. It's a very poorly executed bait and switch. And you can see it coming from a mile away, like I said. And he wanted her for the role so much that he accommodated Marianne Cotillard's pregnancy into the filming schedule. Which is just, I, I will just say, which is such a shame in terms of what could have been with that character. Uh, Talia al Ghul has such a complicated relationship with Bruce Wayne in the comics that yeah. was just not that did not come up to the same fruition that it did in this film. There were really no. more layers to that com- complex relationship and Batman's relationship to the League of Shadows and with the Al Ghuls um, overall that really could have been better portrayed. But at the end of the day, it just was not what we would have hoped i think they would have been better off just not even including her in the movie just have bane as the villain and we mentioned earlier about the stuff we could have cut out you cut out a lot of the stuff in this movie you end up with a an amazing tight crisp two-hour movie but my biggest problem with the storytelling nolan's timeline for just the batman character now this is I think a lot of people share this opinion. If you look at the three movies, he was basically Batman for a year, a year and a half, and then just calls it quits because Rachel dies. The last movie ended with Batman's or Gordon's speech about how he'll he'll never stop fighting for Gotham. Fast forward eight years later, and Batman's just retired, moping around in his mansion, sad about Rachel dying. It's kind of, it just goes against the character of Batman. Everything that we've previously seen. I'm just talking about my own experience with the character in the in the older movies, but also like the animated series. In this one, he's kind of just a character who just puts the mob out of business, and he's like, "Well, I guess that's it." Right. It's not, and I think this is why when you know I, I hinted at earlier, even for me, it doesn't feel like quite like how Batman would play out with certain aspects. It's that. There is when you think of Batman, that is someone so driven whose ego is so just warped. And I mean that in the Batman way of that it is upon him to have this never ending fight against crime. And I don't think that that includes losing people along the way when you're Batman. Yeah. Real quick one note on the acting. I forgot to mention this earlier when we talked about Marion Cotillard. The reason I don't think she works for the role, her demeanor is very cold. And I think in order to sell the seduction of Bruce Wayne, you need a very warm character that's capable of acting out that warmth. And she just doesn't do it for me. But before we get to the third reason of why it wasn't it better, I don't know if you noticed this. There is a crossover here with the first movie that we covered, Planet of the Apes, Chris Ellis. The actor who plays the pastor who runs the orphanage in this movie, the orphanage where John Blake's character grew up, he is in Planet of the Apes, the Tim Burton one. He is the space station commander who narrates the super convenient video log that Marky Mark discovers when he finds like the fossilized ship. That's the same actor. So we're going to have to make sure that we're creating these links in each episode. So for that next episode, we'll we'll make sure that we have a, an identifier that keeps all of these films. Do we have to now deliberately choose a movie that has some kind of, it's like the, the six degrees of separation. We're just, eventually we're going to run out, but I mean, I'm not against it. We'll find it. We'll find it. But anyway, it's, it's probably not a good reason to choose the next movie, but whatever. Number three, this is the third reason of why wasn't it better. So we talked about the storytelling the convoluted plot of this movie. Normally with superhero movies, I'm willing to forgive a flimsy plot, but there's a lot of holes in this one. Well, well let's go. Let's let's uh let's get a slice of this Swiss cheese. <laughs> <laughs> the legacy of Harvey Dent is curious in this movie. I went back and I you know, I watched all three movies to prepare for this. Watching Harvey Dent's downfall at the end of The Dark Knight. So, he gets Rachel dies. He gets half his face burned off. He goes insane and he ultimately goes on like a, would you call it a several hour rampage? It's not that long, right? Fair. Yeah. Fair. (laughs) During which he murders two people. The first one is a corrupt cop who had a hand in his downfall. And the second one is a mob boss, right? And he also threatens James Gordon's family, which is horrific. I understand that. And then Batman intervenes and ultimately kills him. Why did they cover that up? Like, that's not... 
that bad? It's bad, but how would that invalidate all of the criminals being incarcerated? Like, why not just, why did they have to lie about it? I know this is a stupid question because it's just like, well, that's how Nolan wrote the movie. But why not just tell people like, yeah, his face got burned off. His girlfriend got killed. He had a mental breakdown. End of story. That does not invalidate all the previous good deeds that he did. I don't disagree with you, but I kind of wonder when we know that there was another storyline that would have occurred had Heath Ledger not unfortunately passed away. I wonder if the unraveling would have felt yeah. better paced with a character like the Joker somehow, some way. Think, like the, the th- like it would have made more sense. Whereas I think because this, this is film, a backup plan. Yeah. Whereas in this film, a lot of that unraveling felt forced or just felt like okay, like I we get it. This happened in the last film. They don't just not tell the truth about him. They double down on it. They're like, we're gonna we're gonna make a statue of this guy. We're gonna make a Harvey Dent day. We're gonna pass a Harvey Dent Act that apparently illegally incarcerates criminals. I don't know how that works. Just downplay the guy. He's dead. Just don't ever talk about him again. But they needed the White Knight. Some of the other plot holes, I'm just going to go through them. Feel free to chime in, because I know I have more problems with the plot than you. John Blake just knows that Bruce Wayne is Batman because he saw a look on his face as a kid when Wayne visited his orphanage. This is actual writing? Well, this is how you create a character that is supposed to be a stand-in for Robin, as they've hinted at, right? but at the same time is in himself a fantastic detective and who better than the one that could detect Bruce Wayne as a child. Yeah. Was not I sense great, sarcasm right? here. I think, yeah, I thank you. Um, Bruce Wayne hurt his leg eight years earlier and just decides to get it looked at. Now, this is a big one. You know, Batman better than I do. Alfred would never abandon Bruce, no matter what was going on. And he especially wouldn't abandon him when he's at his most vulnerable. That was a that was a tearjerker to see, and I think that it was supposed to be a bit of a humbling moment for Bruce Wayne during the film, but this viewer in particular felt that it was not very uh not not very alfred esque yeah when that happened I mean, it's a to your point it's a brilliantly acted scene, but every time I see it, I'm like, damn, he gonna do him like that like really. Here's one of my biggest problems with the plot. This is the this is something they should have just completely cut from the movie because it's it's idiotic. There is a terrorist attack on the stock exchange and they just let all the trades happen. L- Lucius Fox, he later tells Bruce Wayne after Bruce Wayne somehow loses all of his money in a single stock trade. He said it could take months to prove fraud was behind your money problems. How? Why? Like, there was a, there was a terrorist attack on the stock exchange. Bruce Wayne is in in this he is self-described in this universe as one of the richest most powerful people in the world and he gets cleaned out by a single stock trade he even tells miranda at one point they're letting me keep the house like doesn't he own the house he doesn't have a mortgage on it does he it's supposed to show that uh now this is just my theory when it comes to all of that plot of course it's trying to fit in the the tone like the political tone of the time whether or not it actually makes sense it's idiotic so right they even repo his lamborghini like did he did he have a car note look i had enough Which, problems with this yeah. that i went ahead and i bought the novelization of this movie in the hopes that to it would try shed to get more light. sense of it I, I was like well maybe it'll fill in some of the gaps no it's the same stupid shit in the novelization none of it makes any uh, sense it kind of I rubbed mean, me the figured... wrong way because i just mm. Nolan went out of his way to make these movies as realistic as possible. And this part to me is just because it, it's very important to the plot, right? This whole stock market thing. And I don't get it. At the same right. time, it was just Nolan trying to do too much. Yeah, I, th- I think he bit off more than he can chew here. When it gets to the plot, though, The Dark Knight had very clever writing. And it had a pretty engaging plot. And the Dark Knight Rises kind of felt like the generic terrorist wielding a nuclear bomb threat. I acknowledge that you can probably go back and poke holes in the Joker's plan. But what it what made it work for me is that the timeline of the Joker's plan was unfolding of, over a period of hours or maybe days at the most. So it gave the audience 
little time to think about the details. So Bane's plan is unfolding over literal months. And it has too many steps. I'm going to walk you through them just in case. This is pretty complex. Number one, kidnap Russian scientist and fake his death six months in advance. Number two, have John Daggett try to take over Wayne Enterprises. But oh, hey, that's fake. We only need him for his construction company. Number three, steal Bruce Wayne's fingerprints to execute obviously fake stock trades, somehow bankrupting Wayne in the process via terrorist attack on stock exchange. Number four, count on the now destitute Wayne turning to Miranda Tate for help. Number five, have Miranda Tate take over Wayne Enterprises because she's already on the board. Number six, have Russian scientists turn fusion reactor into a bomb, then murder him. Number seven, break Batman's back and put him in a Middle Eastern prison. Are you with me so far? Yes, this is a... I can also imagine Bane writing down each step in his journal. He's like, oh, it's a multi-step. Number eight, blow up bridges and hold Gotham City hostage for five months. Number nine... Put nuclear bomb on truck and drive it around for five months. Number 10, trap entire Gotham City police force underground for five months. Number 11, <laughs> make Batman watch future events on TV while in said Middle Eastern prison. And here's a bonus for number 12, discredit Harvey Dent and free all prisoners. Number 13, or 12, whatever, declare martial law and wreak all kinds of havoc. And last but not least... <laughs> Detonate nuclear bomb anyway. Wouldn't it just have just been easier to steal a nuke and blow it up? Well, there are so many things with that, with a time span, that I'm just thinking about, like, one, Bane is ripped as all hell during that whole time period, while at the same time trying to keep a low profile and not get caught. Where is he finding his protein? Is, is the League of Shadows just funneling in protein shakes? Is he putting, how is he getting time in to also get that ripped and jacked? I know if I'm not putting in my reps, how am I going to, how am I going to make sure to have that same bicep, like just size and let's, let's be, let's be quite frank. Bane was just cut throughout that whole film. So even with all of this going on, even just the logistics in this so-called realistic universe that Christopher Nolan created. I don't know how Bane was able to keep up with that workout regimen. Look, he's impressive. He was putting in that work, to your point. He was getting the reps in. I think there's just easier ways to pull off blowing up Gotham with a nuclear bomb. Yeah. I see the seeds planted in this plot for what would become the convoluted mess that was Tenet. Now, Ooh. to be fair, I've only seen Tenet once. I've only seen Hot Tenet take. once. I don't know. Tenet's... Do people love Tenet? I... I didn't hate it. People I, just, did, I no, only saw it the didn't. one time. People didn't, and it did get, uh, yeah, it, it got lukewarm reception. I was, I have to see it again because I was very confused by the plot. Now, I, I was not confused by the plot of this movie. I just think it is needlessly complex. There is no reason to have. We already alluded to it in, in the second reason of why it wasn't better. You could have cut out a lot of stuff in this movie, and I think just end up with a better movie. Now, when you're seeing this movie for the first time, you don't have a time. You don't have time to absorb all these points. Like when I first saw this movie, I loved it. This is one of those rare times when I think it would have been better if they just dumbed things down. There's too many layers, too many moving parts, too many people involved. This is just my take as well. When you think about what was included in this film and what wasn't included in the previous film. When you look at the Dark Knight Rises returns back into the Batman story and origin, whereas the previous film almost felt like it was a comic in itself, right? Whereas this this film was a continuation of the film series, which required having to go back to plot points in the first film, wanting to tie loose ends and make it feel more complete, which at the same time doesn't allow you the same... Uh, just doesn't uh, doesn't allow for the same ability to be able to tell just another story in the Batman universe. It's having to tell an end, like a a nice little bow end to the film, which at the same time creates a a plot that seems a bit bigger and heftier. So especially with compared to the last one, 
it's 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 a bit of a a lot to chew through. It is. I think it is worth pointing out that this movie is not that much longer than The Dark Knight, but it feels a lot longer when you're watching it. The Dark Knight clocked in around two thirty, so this is about fifteen minutes longer, but it's just it feels a lot more bloated. Kind of like Bane's plan. It goes on for months and it works against the movie because you have this plan that's unfolding over five months. And yet by the time Batman returns to Gotham, it changes into, oh, by the way, we have like 10 minutes to defuse this bomb. So it's like <laughs> so the rest, good. The, the previous five months feels like a cheat. It, it ends up being just like any other superhero movie where there's a ticking time bomb and we have to save it before it goes off. There's plenty of stuff that you could cut out. And I like for do you remember the part where the US special forces they sneak into Gotham, they meet up with Gordon and Blake and the cops, who then right. take them to see Fox and Tate, who then tell them that well, he's like Morgan Freeman's like, the bomb will explode in twenty three days, no matter what. That was a really good impression. That was impressive. Thank you. And then the soldiers are then betrayed and killed. Complete waste of storytelling time. It's pure exposition. It exists only for the audience. Fox could have just explained this to Batman. You don't need this. The, the, the soldiers being there doesn't go anywhere and adds nothing. It just wastes almost 10 minutes of the movie. I mentioned this before, how Nolan, I think, did too much with the plot. Anytime you involve a nuke, it drastically inflates the stakes. And I think those stakes are too big for a comic book movie that's being hinged on realism. You know, like you look at something like um, the Avengers movies, they have these giant like world global plots where the whole world is being threatened. That works really well for that universe of what the Avengers has established. But Nolan's Batman movies are supposed to be so realistic where I think the plots work better when they're much smaller and much more contained. And by him introducing a nuke, it inflates it. It's, it's like uh, the idea of like leveling, right? There should be something relative to the strength leveling of the hero that creates like a good foil, but not necessarily something that just seems out of scale. Otherwise, it either it turns into trying to have the equivalent of a nuke to defeat a nuke or something that kind of seems too, like, as you said, almost out of place or how, what what is it even doing here within the plot to be even uh to even make it fit into a very complex storyline. Yeah, they. I think they just waste too much time telling the story. Like Talia, Mir Miranda Tate, whatever, she was already on Bruce Wayne's board. She had access to the... She could have gotten access to the bomb somehow before, probably. Bruce Wayne, his back gets healed somehow. His back is literally broken. It's sticking out of his back, and it just gets healed. And the third act of this movie, it's sloppy. Seeing Batman operate during the day was pretty jarring. I've never seen that in a movie before. It, but this is the other thing. I don't know if you found this as silly as I did. Bane's army has guns. The cops have guns. And yet they decide to engage each other in like a Gangs of New York style hand-to-hand -hand battle. That was weird. It felt like the director had both sides of, of his action figures together and then said, all right, then they'll come into the middle and fight. Which is exactly yeah. what happened, right? They just throw down their guns and fisticuffs. Yeah. It, it was, it, I kind of thought it was weird the first time I saw it. And now every time subsequently I've seen it, it's, it's kind of laughable. Not as laughable as Talia's death, though. Terrible acting from Marion Cotillard. She does kind of a head roll thing. She's uh, 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 laughable. There was uh, also just something about how when you think about all of the villains or Bane's army having the guns in the film, aren't they so ruthless that they wouldn't even give moments to allow for like, to allow for a quote unquote fair fight. Like you would imagine they would just want to shoot cops on sight. They could have, but that's not good for a film. They didn't just have guns. They had tanks. They had a bunch of those, uh, Oh, that tumblers? Well, they had all they of, they, had, they had all of Batman's. Yeah. Uh, yeah. equipment. Didn't really use it. Could have, no, they, yeah, yeah. Bane kind of blew a lead there. It's pretty kind of a choke job. But, but what, look, what, 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 what did the film do well? There's great stuff in this movie. Nolan is 
arguably the best director today at staging set piece action. He reaches, I think, like Spielbergian levels of giving the audience something they've never seen before, which is an almost impossible task in the CGI era. And this don't, movie contains... If you don't contains, believe us, listeners, there's a lot of films that really do display that. Yeah. So many action movies these days feel the same, look the same. His movies absolutely stand apart. This movie's no exception. There's some amazing set pieces in this movie. The opening plane hijacking was, I think, filmed entirely practically, and it, it looks incredible. Also subtly references a James Bond movie, License to Kill. The attack on the stock exchange, even though I think plot-wise it's stupid, it's a pretty awesome set piece. And then the first Batman versus Bane fight, amazing. Amazing. Yeah, for, for everything that we've touched on, you can't knock on the fact that Nolan knows how to create the set of a universe and make you believe what you're seeing on that screen. 100%. My last plot point, I think I skipped this accidentally. Maybe you can answer this. Why did Bruce Wayne have to fake his death? Uh, to ensure that he could, I mean, of, of course the film implies to ensure that he could walk away from the life of the Batman. But it also presented itself with... It, it also, I think, was written in to just say, like, yeah, he's not going to do any more of these films. There will be no sequel. Somehow, John Blake is going to be able to come Robin, even though he doesn't have any money. Actually, let's, like, think about that for a sec. If his name is Robin, and we want this to be, if there was going to be a continuation of the Batman films, then he wouldn't name himself Robin in the streets. Right. Could it be Night Nightwing, maybe? The Nightwing, right? As it as it uh as it evolved in the comics, but or maybe even he just would have been Batman. But is he gonna get access to Bruce Wayne's money? Because the whole reason that Bruce Wayne can be Batman is is he's rich, right? But so like if if Robin in this let's say there was a hypothetical sequel and Robin it becomes Nightwing, right? And he has like the equivalent of a Batmobile. How does he pay for it? Like if it breaks down, like what what does he do? I hope Batwing or or I, I hope that Nightwing or Robin has a triple A because Imagine him calling. Hey, it's Robin. Uh <laughs> shouldn't have been in the movie. Yeah. That or, 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 uh, I'll try this out. I hope I hope the man has triple A. <laughs> he could do commercials for it. Yeah. Oh, so that's what that feels like. <laughs> i think look the fourth reason why wasn't this better is it's the third film in a trilogy this movie delivered what anyone who saw batman begins in the dark Knight would have wanted to see but the odds were so heavily stacked against it it had almost no way of not being disappointing in my opinion it doesn't hold a candle to the dark Knight, which is dare i say a historic movie and not that i don't want to make it seem like the academy awards means everything because it doesn't i don't but i don't think it's a coincidence this movie got completely shut out by the oscars it didn't even get one nomination whereas the dark knight got eight right and going back to the fact that it's a fil third film in a trilogy history shows that being able to put up a third film let alone like let alone how hard it is to have a sequel that's even close to as good as the first having a, a third film in a trilogy be good. Um, that's just a law. It's just in a long line of third acts that just don't live up to that hype. I mean, historically bad Godfather three horrifying Superman three Toby Maguire's dancing in Spider-Man three <laughs> Batman forever. Kind of like Batman. Forever. The, the ride doesn't <laughs> end in pirates of the Caribbean three. Just so on, so forth. I mean, just because the the first two films in this trilogy are so highly regarded, especially the second one, The yeah. Dark Knight Rises will always enjoy a favorable or will always enjoy a favorable reputation or a favorable uh reputation. Um But what what are your thoughts? Uh uh what are your thoughts there, Patrick? I I I think like The Godfather 3 it's it's individual reputation will shrink over time. But a lot of people like this movie and I know I've been pretty harsh on this movie. I have a feeling we're going to catch a lot of flack or I'm going to catch a lot of flack for my opinion of this movie. I think I was pretty fair with my criticisms. 
in, I mean, wrapping it up here, like as far as like why wasn't it better? I think number one, did Nolan actually was he actually invested in it? Number two, the story involves too many characters. It's too long. It's too complex. The plot number three, the plot is just a convoluted mess. Number four, it's it's like you said, it's the third film in a trilogy. Did you like but, it, Anton? Yeah, I liked it. It may not have been the best Batman film, may not have been the best superhero film, but in itself, I did like it. And for all its flaws, everything we talked about, I did like it. What about you, Patrick? I actually do like this movie. This this may shock you with every, everything that I just said about this movie. I do like it. It This is the first movie that we're covering that falls under the category of good movie, bad sequel. And for me, it's kind of tough to rate because I think it, at the same time, it's a, it's a success and it's a failure. If we're judging it as a standalone action movie, I think it's very good. It's very well made. It's got some great performances in it. Very emotional scenes. Hans Zimmer score, once again, amazing. Objectively speaking, it's one of the best action movies of the 2010s. But at the same time, it's not a standalone movie. It's a sequel. It's a Batman movie. And based on what it was, it just should have been better. I really do think that. Every time I see this movie, I like it a little less. It's probably my least favorite Nolan movie. Ultimately, I was just... Been, it, it could have been, been way better. better. I think I was just ultimately disappointed with the direction that Nolan took the story and the characters in. His handling of the timeline really bothers me. I understand that's subjective. But I, the foundational story on which it was built is flawed, and the story just doesn't take off for me. For me, this will always be a what-if movie. I will always think about why wasn't this better. Just like something like The Godfather 3, this movie was like two or three storytelling decisions and a couple of different casting choices away from achieving true greatness. There's good stuff in it, but considering the predecessors, I think it's a cut below. Now, despite all that being said, I would probably give this like a, a C minus or a B plus. Besides the storytelling choices, which I think were pretty flawed, almost everything else in this movie is top notch. Right. Cinematography, top notch. Yeah. Uh, yep. Like set, great. Costuming, lighting. Uh, yeah. Pace, like the, the, there's a lot there that to like. And at the end of the day, there's there's no such thing as a perfect film. Oh, there might arguably, be. Argue, arguably. As, as a, particularly as a comic book fan, it's films like this that we have to thank for continued investment in these films or in these kinds of films or being able to take risks on these kinds of films. Because for sure. it's not easy to be able to take an adaptation of a comic book and try to realize it in a real, like a real life setting. So... While those stories for whether the Dark Knight Returns, whether Nightfall, uh, to bring into the silver screen without having a campy or goofy aesthetic, it's being able to take that same lens of a dark and gritty Gotham that Christopher Nolan was able to take and push out his hardest for three overall very, very good films. Despite that, we had the third, The Dark Knight Rises, which, while it may not have led up to the same expectations of its pre of its predecessors, um, in itself, in my opinion, not bad, and still was able a pretty good film. But but having said that, it could have been better. What do you give it? Would you rate it? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a solid B, a solid B. It's fair. It was just too pretty of a film for like aesthetically on a lot of different points for me to rank it any lower. I think that's totally fair. I can't disagree with it. I didn't, I didn't rank it much, much farther below you. And look, this is still a better Batman movie than a lot of the other ones. Although that might say more about the previous Batman movies, You're right. but this got me. Th so do you consider the dark Knight to be a perfect movie? Well, I, I did just say there's no such thing as a perfect film. But if we are going to think what, what comes to closest, the second one is probably one of the... I don't know, but like, the, have the, you the, ever the, seen the, a movie where you're like, I would, I would not change a single thing about that? Like, that's how I feel about something like Back to the Future. I wouldn't change anything. Godfather Part movie. 2. Yeah. Or even Godfather 1. Godfather 1, Godfather Part 2. Yeah. But... I think Dark Knight, yeah. 
Maggie Gyllenhaal, too ugly. <laughs> I think this is fair uh, criticism. Look, I, considering Katie Holmes didn't want to come back, they cast Maggie Gyllenhaal. I'm sorry. I just, I never believed that crime lords and district attorneys were going to fight over that face. It's just not believable. I was going to say, did not feel bad when we saw the, the explosion scene. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just okay. said, I, I just said she's not even good looking enough that I'd approach her in a bar. I, I fair, okay. Anton's so like, yeah, stick- I didn't even care when she got blown up. Like, <laughs> uh, well, that uh, brings us to the conclusion of this episode. I just wanted to uh, hint at what our next, or let's let's uh, let's give the listeners what our next, what the next film that we'll be talking about. Yeah, Anton, is. this is your pick now. I know this is my pick, and I was actually really excited about this one. I am excited to dive into Tron Legacy. Oh, okay. Ready to dive into the mainframe? Yes, I, 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 I am. That is, uh, I did not expect that. All right. Well, I'm Anton Paras. I'm Patrick Darms. And this is Why Wasn't It Better? See you guys next week. Take care.